Okay, so I'm going to cover, I think, three things today. The three things I wanted to cover, these are just really tips that I wish somebody had shown me. So if you've got somewhere to be, like, you can take off. But I think I'll, I'll try and make this worth your while to be here. The three things I'll cover is how to make um, hyperlinks to references and figures in Word and how to use styles in Word, right? So Word, there's easy and hard ways to type, and there's a, I'm going to try and show you an easy way. The second one is how to use a reference manager, right? Okay, and there's free ones that will make references way, way, way better to use. And the third one is how to make nice figures, right? Sure. So let's start with the, the most important one, which is how to use Word. So what I did, while well, you guys were off in, uh, in the lab still, I came over here and I just put together sort of like the bones of some of the stuff that goes in a lab report. We've prepared a document. Let me jump over to it. We've prepared a document that describes what should be in a lab report in a little bit greater detail. This on pulls up. It's on Canvas. If you click on Files and then you go to the MSC 2010 Lab or whatever. Oh, it's so slow in here. And no internet. Are we gonna have no internet today? You can play the dinosaur game. You can play the dinosaur <laughs> game. Here, I know what I'll do. I have the actual file, so I will go to where I keep the file. So you guys will see. The, let's see. MSC Lab Report Writing Guide. This is in the file section. You should be able to find this. So this talks about like what should go in your lab report. Things like, well, there should be an abstract. There should be an introduction, right? So I've only said a few words about it here, like almost nothing. For the more complete treatment of what should go in there, check out this preparation guide. Um, I wrote this with Mike Scarpula, Jeff Bates, and uh, the, what used to be the clear instructor, Justin Whitney. So these are all people who taught courses. So it's stuff that we actually care about so this is stuff we want to see in it we talk a little about the stuff I'm going to describe right now like styles and using internal references and stuff but use this for a more detailed explanation of what I'm going to cover today but for now let's just start with our bare bones right let's say you've got a, a title right so the very first thing I want to show you how to use is style so you're going to click on your title and uh, if you go to the different tabs up here you got all these different tabs the first one under home there's this style section maybe you guys are unlike me and you already know how to use this but go ahead and click title and it has one that's already set aside as titles. And that's maybe not the type of style that you want. Maybe you want to tweak it a little bit. Can you find that? Oh, I just open up Word and just type this. Yeah, I just pull up Word. So here, maybe like, first off, they're using Calibri. They've got some size. Sometimes it's funny colors. What I, first thing I want to show you is that you can modify this and it will stay that way for the rest of the time that you're working in this document. So what you do is go ahead and highlight this text and let's say you want your whole document to be in Times New Roman. You know, that's a pretty standard thing to do. But 28 is really pretty big for the title. So you want 18 and maybe you want it bold or something, right? So now you've got a title and you also want it centered, right? So there's your lab title. What you can do is once you've got it how you like it, whatever you've done to it, you can come up over here to the styles under title where you were before. If you right click this, you can click this update title to match selection. And now if you were to have any other title in your document, it would assign that same series of sort of uh, styles to it. Now that's not very helpful here because it's just your title. And you usually only have one of those, so you can say it's not saving many time. But there's other things where it will save you time. Like you're under your section headings. In a lab report, you typically have an abstract, you have an introduction, you have experimental methods, you have results, you have discussion, you have conclusion and you have references. So it's like six or seven things. Rather than formatting each one of those individually, I think it's worth your time just to set up something. So I come here and I go to heading number one, like the first type of heading. I click it and it's blue and it's Calibri and it's not stuff that I want, right? So just like before, I can change this and make it times. And maybe I want it like size 14, but I do also want it bold, um, but I don't want that blue text. I want it to be, you know, whatever color you want, black in this case. Again, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to update my headings to match this selection. Now all I have to do is on all these other ones, I just come and click heading one, heading one, oh. heading one, heading one, right? You can do this to all of these and it just makes it easier. This also changes things like your line spacing, indenting preferences. It'll change that automatic, automatically to it. You can do something for your normal text. Right now my normal text, right, is Calibri. You could do times though. Um, let me highlight this whole thing and do that, right? And I could update all of my normal text to do that and it changes it throughout the document. So this is the first thing I want to show you. That will save you some time, right? That's the first thing. Next thing I want to show you is how to use built-in reference managers and hyperlinks within Word. This is critical for one thing, right? So let's say you start out with your summary, you put the stuff in the summary you want, you talked about the abstract, you described you know, why you're solving your problem, you tell people how you went about doing your research and basically the instruments you used. 
Finally, you get to your results, and almost always in your results, this is where you start introducing figures, right? You measured something in a, you looked at a picture under a microscope, right? Like thing, you snapped a picture of it, or maybe you, you measured some property and you plotted that as a function of temperature or load or whatever else. All right, so let's grab some data from the internet. Now we have the internet again. All right, so grab some scientific data, right? Something like this, looking very scientific. So we're gonna copy this. And what you've probably done in the past, in high school or wherever else you last wrote a lab report, um, you just write this, you type figure one, uh, looks like climate stuff, right? I don't know what it is. But then, uh, let's say that you wanna do another figure, right? And it's gonna be, I don't know, this awesome thing. Right? Clearly belongs in a lab report. So you're gonna just paste this in here and go ahead and add a figure to a wormhole. I don't know what it is, right? So it's not a big deal, except then you also have to consider that you're probably talking about these figures in your text. As we can see, the wormhole is blue. See figure two, right? So what happens, the challenge is, what happens if in your editing process as you're going through and you're like, you know what, I should have talked about the wormhole before I talked about the climate data. And then you have to move it ahead. Now this becomes figure one, which means everywhere in your text that you had C figure two, you have to try and remember, oh, which figure was that now and which one did it move to? I promise if, if you only have three figures in your paper, you won't care about this. When you write your senior thesis and you're gonna have 20 figures, 25 figures, I don't know, more, you will definitely, it'll drive you crazy if you have to move things or something like that. So what you want, you want this to update automatically. So there's an easy way to do that. Here's how it works. You go to your figure, when you first pasted it there, and you right click on it, and you click insert caption, right? That, I apologize, this is tiny. That says figure one up here, and it gives you a label. First off, it's asking, hey, is this a figure, or is this something else? Because sometimes people paste like equations as, as figures. So you can tell, yeah, it's a figure. It's not a table or anything else. It's a figure, and what's the caption? Well, you can make it say anything you want, but just leave it figure one is, I think, generally the right way. You can change your numbering if you want like Roman numerals or whatever else, you can select whatever you want to label it. Just do figures, one, two, three, though. So you right click and go to... Yeah, let me show you one more time how to do it. On the figure that you pasted on here, I right click and it said insert caption. Hit that and it's gonna pull this up. We're just gonna say okay. And it automatically creates this thing. So now you say the climate stuff or whatever we were talking about there, right? Now check out the difference. When I highlight both of these, what's different about those? One has uh, that darker indent on one, which indicates yeah. it's like active. Yeah, it means it's hyperlinked to something, that it's referenced to something else. Like, it's not a regular number. It's not like I just typed one there. It's a word recognizes that is part of a series, and therefore it keeps track of where you move around in your document, which I'll show you, which is why that's, why that's cool. By the way, the default setting for this is kind of funny looking, right? The font there got small, it did italics. If you wanted to change that, you could, right? If you wanted this to be all bold, for whatever reason, you can. And you just need to come here to your styles and you notice that we're currently on caption. It already knew that that's a caption, so it assigned it the style for caption. But we can update that just like everything else, right, if you want. I think it's blue, you could have changed the color, but you know, it's fine. So that means we can get rid of this. Now let's do the same thing over here for our wormhole. You're gonna, you're gonna right click it, insert caption, say okay. And you're gonna say wormhole or whatever the caption is, right? That's not a very good caption but that's what, that's what we're using for right now, right? It's using the same caption style as we just updated before, right, because it knows to use the right style. But now check this out, this is where it gets really bad. Oh, let me show you one more thing. Instead of typing figure two here, now we want to call that figure, right? We want to call the reference to it so that if we move around, it stays with it. So we're going to do this. You're going to go C, and then you come up here to the reference tab, right? Your word has this. I don't know how far back it has, but you probably have this on your tabs. Go to reference and you're gonna insert a cross-reference. So you're gonna to go to reference, and then over here, it's right next to the insert caption, but you're gonna insert a cross-reference. You click that, and it says, all right, well, what reference are we talking about? Is this just a numbered item? Like if you were talking about a series of sections in your paper, you could label them like section one, 1, 1.1. That's the numbered item. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a figure. So scroll down in this list. It's not an equation, it's not an endnote. It is a figure. Click figure. And by default, it lets you insert the reference as the entire caption. I don't know why you'd ever do that. C figure one, the climate stuff. That doesn't make sense. You just want it to say C figure one. So change this to just the label and the number, right? And then pick the figure that you want it to be. I think we're doing figure two right now, right? There it is, figure two. So now if you highlight this stuff, 
you see that same darkened highlighted text that Brennan mentioned. It's not only on two of figure two, but also the whole figure two that's in the text. And, yeah, go ahead. That's how you know if, you, if it's a hyperlink as opposed to something you just type. And then what's great is you can take this, I can cut this, and let's say you know your editor, Emily or, or Christian, they basically said like, why are you putting this at the end? This should go in the beginning. You say, great, no problem. And at first you say, hey, it didn't fix it. There's a problem. Well, you can update it. And I can't remember where you find it, but the easy way I do it is you just control A, that will select your entire document, and then hit function or F9, and it will update those. So now this is, because we moved it one, it is figure one. This is now figure two. Again, I promise if you're writing something short with two, three figures, you're like, what's the point? When you guys get jobs and you guys have to prepare much larger documents, and you all will, you'll have to prepare things with lots of figures, this is the only way to do it. It'll save you a ton of time. And it's, it's, it takes two seconds to set up in the beginning, and then it's way easier afterwards, right? It's really easy to call back to like, oh, you know, as, as you expect from equation four, and it knows the equation four is the specific one that you cited. Anyway, so that's the first trick I want to show you with Word. Anything else I should show them here, guys, on Word? Christian, Emily, am I forgetting something? Are there ways to hyperlink text to other texts, so like a certain page? Or like to a certain other paragraph. I know you can do it with titles. You can make these. Uh, you, you can make those part of it because they become like part of this like numbered item. I haven't done it in a while. Um, I'd have to review it to see how you do that. Um, let me show you the next valuable thing though. I know you, you can do that though because you can say like as discussed in section two, and then if you introduce a new section, it'll still know that it's section two as opposed to something else. It does track those. The next thing I want to show you guys has to do with references, right? You guys will have to write with references. In fact, this is a big part of college, learning how to cite things properly. And plagiarism is something that always comes up every year. There's always issues with plagiarism. It's usually not intentional. It's just that students sometimes haven't been taught what to cite, how much should you cite, like how, what's the right way to do it. So if you take anything that's original idea and contents that you came up with, you're fine to just type it. But if you're taking something that you took the, the results of somebody else, right, especially with published results, you just need to cite it. Right, and I think some people think that like they should just copy and paste up off of Wikipedia or whatever because it makes them look smart because they found good content. We like the content. I like that to be in my in, in the lab reports you guys write. I just want you to cite it correctly, right? So how do you cite things? We're gonna teach you a really helpful trick to do that. If you guys go to uh, just Chrome or whatever and type my endnote web or something, that it should pull up as the first. <coughs> yeah, my endnoteweb.com, all one word. My endnoteweb.com. EndNote is a commercial software you can buy, and for some reason they made a free version of their product which works like perfectly great. Like it's wonderful. Maybe it like limits you to like twenty thousand citations or something. Like for for what you guys are gonna do, this works great. There's other free ones if you'd like to use. There's Mendeley and Zotero, which are also free ones. I've used both of them. They're fine. I like EndNote though. I think it's the easiest. Go ahead and click it. When you go here, you have to sign up for an account. Just like sign up with your Facebook or LinkedIn. They have different options. Do something easy to sign up. So I've already got my account, but you could sign up using whatever. LinkedIn if you want to be professional. Right? Go ahead, sign in. And the first thing you're going to see when you come here is the following. We're all on it. Yeah. First thing you're going to see, um, if you haven't set it up, you're not going to have a lot of this stuff. I use this regularly, so I already see that I'm using this. So, for example, I see here under my references, I have a total of 965 references I've put in here, right? Now, they're not all just in a random pool. I've set, I've set them aside to different projects. So, on one grant, like my uh, Porous Thermoelectrics grant, we used a whole bunch, right? Or, uh, you know, Floor Polymers, we've got a few. And then some of these, if it has like the icon of people next to it, that means I've actually shared that with somebody else. So this is really powerful. You guys are going to work on teams. And if you're all doing this, you wonder like, how are we going to keep our references all put together? You, uh, you can share. I can, I can invite Brennan, for example, to work with me on my ceramic <coughs> algae filters, right? My reference list. And he could contribute there as well, right? So this is where it's going to go. So then the question is, how do you get your references from wherever into Endnote? That's the next thing I want to show you. So to do that, we use a tool called Google Scholar. You guys are already using Google Scholar, I hope. At some point you've used it before. It's it's genius. When I was a student, it didn't exist. We had to use something called SciFinder, which you had to pay for, which means we had to use it at a lab on campus. It was just a pain in the butt. Um, now it's just way, way, way better. Google Scholar is as good as anything else out there, I feel like. It's terrific. It's what I use for all my research. So here's how it works. You, you're going to search for something. So next next week you're, you're learning about electrochromics. 
So you type in electrochromic films, right? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you're off campus and you want to use like the libraries of uh, yep. research things, you have to sign in. So if we're on campus, will we automatically be signed in here, or will we have to sign you in to will, the You will. You should have access to the articles if you're on campus because it recognizes it by IP address. Okay. But you can get off campus access. Mm -hmm. Where do I have it? Like, it'll show you which article we're going to use. Right here, let me open this. You can get VPN access from home. So, or, no, oh, they just close this? Yeah, so just go to the oh, library. Oh, so just go to the library and then research the databases under G. Oh, and then it goes to Google. Ah, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so from home, from your computer, you just log into the library page. And then you go to Google Scholar through the library page. And then yeah. you have access to everything you would normally on campus. Okay. You, you Good to know. You have to go through the library about Google About Okay, we do. So let's say you're looking through whatever, right? Um, electrochromic films, something related to your research, and you wanna you wanna do your lit, re lit review right, meaning you're gonna cite what people have done in this field. So read through these articles. When you find ones that are relevant that you need to talk about, right? The first person to do this was this guy, or this lady figured out the clever way to do it with these materials, whatever it is. Now now you click on these, and the current way that you do references is how? How would you do this? Like if you wanted to cite this, what would you do? Like look up the Publisher and the author and the yeah, it's this big long process. Like you look at it and you're like, okay, we got a title. We have our authors right here. We've got yeah. like or the you journal. Steal the DOI and put it into yeah. Yeah. So here's what here's what I suggest you do. You can do that by hand, and sometimes these even have like a little download our references thing. But even that's worse. Here's how you do it. Come over here, and under the heading, once you know that you do want to cite that article, and you know what you want to say about it. Grab this little cite button right there. Click cite, and you could just copy it under, here's five different styles, which are common reference styles, but you can even do better, right? You could just copy and paste that into your references at the end, but you're still going to run into the same problems before, right? What if you use that sentence at the beginning of your paper, so you've got reference one. And then you have to move and it. And then you've got to move it. And this is a pain because your, re your, your journal article, your, your things you write up should have a significant number of references. At least 10, I think is the rule, right? We want at least 10 references, like learn how to read stuff. So. That's a pain to keep track of. So instead, we're going to use a reference manager. So you're going to click EndNote down here, right? See these little links at the bottom? Click the one that says EndNote. So you highlight first and then EndNote? Here, I'll show you. No, you don't have to highlight anything. Let's pick on this one, right? Let's say I wanted this compound or this paper. I'm going to click Cite. I don't have to highlight anything. It did that automatically. Um, but I just come right down here to EndNote, and I click no, right? And you see that it saved them. It called one scholar one, scholar two, right? And it, it saved as a .enw file, EndNote web file. So we're going to take that and we're going to throw that into our EndNote web collector on the internet, right? Here's how we do it. You go to collect and then import references, right? Collect, import references. When you're there, you're going to go to um, choose your file. I wish you could do these more than one at a time. It's so that you can't. Last I checked, you can. No, you got to click just one at a time. So click this one. You have to tell it what your import type is because it can actually import lots of different styles, ref works, and uh, you know whatever else. I've already told it that I only ever am going to use EndNote import by selecting your favorites here, just to make my life easier. So there's only one option to click. So I suggest doing that. And then you have to tell it what group to send it to, right? I don't. This isn't a real project, so I'm just going to send it to this cryptically named Alex group, which I don't really know what that is. Right, and yeah. Alex it, is going to have a very uh, <laughs> he's getting all sorts of new things. He's like, what is this? And then hit import, and it'll think for a minute, and it will say, uh, I'm in, importing records. And then right here, it'll say one reference was imported to the Alex group. You could do the same thing with your second reference. Actually, we imported that same one yesterday, so we're going to have two of it in there when I go to look at it. Right, import it. It's going to say one reference imported. Right, so now you can click on the Alex group or whatever group you're sending these to. And when you look in here, now it's got all your references you brought in. Yeah, so we did this on Tuesday, so some of these are repeats. It doesn't know when you have a repeat, right? So you can delete it. If you see that you've got a repeat, you can delete it. Um, where is it? Delete. All right, you can kick it out like that. But now that I've got them here, let's say I've collected some data and I'm feeling pretty good about that. Now I want to bring it into Word. So how do you do that? You have to go to Format, Cite While You Write Plugin. This is a free plugin that you download, and uh, then the next time you open Word, what you'll find is there's a new tab that wasn't there before that works, uh, just makes it easy to interact all these references into Word. So I've already done it, so when you get a chance, go ahead and upload it, but you'll see this EndNote tab appears up here that wasn't there before. Go ahead and click that. It has to log in. 
tell it to save your information so you don't have to type it every time. It, it's just doing it automatically for me right now. It takes just a second. It's accessing my NML web account. Now it's open. And then when I want to cite something, like if I'm here, tell us what's been done in the field. If I want to cite something right there at the end of that sentence, all I have to do is click insert citation. And I have to type something. I think these titles said something like W03 in the title. Yeah, there we go. I could cite one of them. I could cite both of them. Like you can highlight both. Let's say we want to cite both of those. I click it. It's automatically applying um, a certain reference style, whatever the style I had for the references, which is academic medicine, for whatever reason that's the last one I was using, right? And if you look at the bottom of the report, it creates a reference um, bibliography right here automatically. It's in that same dark highlighted text, meaning this is something that Word is doing for you that you don't have to mess with. And it will move with you. That is. It's they super powerful, guys. Nice. The they should too. teach the. I agree, I, I had but they to don't. Rearrange for you, and, and it's awful. Classes. It's, it's, awful. it's the absolute awful. worst. It's garbage. So, Three hours of course. And then again, if you want to add something else, like let's say I want to cite something else I've written or a couple things, right? Let's say I want to cite these three papers. I throw them in, right? It's doing the same thing, and then for whatever reason, this section after you edit your paper, you're like, you know, I really need to move that or something. You move it here. You say, I think you might have to. Highlight the whole thing and then hit update citations, and now it's one, two, three, and four, five. Right? Just super, super slick. Let's say that you uh, you're, you're writing this because we're telling you, hey, for this lab report this week, we want you to pretend that you're writing an article that would be submitted to Journal of the Electrochemical Society. Right? Easy. You just search up here. You find Journal of the Electrochemical Society. If you don't see it, come up here to select another style, and there's like a gazillion more. You could scroll down, just go to J. Oh, that's not going to help. There's a million journals, right? You would scroll till you find Journal of Electrochemical Society. This is going to take forever. I'm not going to go there. Co journal of Colloid Interface Science, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, right? You pick the one that you care about, you click it, and it will automatically change how these things are written. What do I mean? It'll change whether or not they have italicized text, whether they have bold, whether you just use the first uh, initial of the name, like J for Jeff as opposed to writing out Jeff. Like, let's pick another one where it does the whole thing. Let's do um, academic medicine. I think I actually have the whole names, right? It should say, yeah. No, Bates just, I thought it didn't. Let's go to ACS. Oh, they're all doing it. But you see how they're changing? Like, some things are bold, some things are italicized. Because every journal has its own persnickety way of wanting their references. I have no idea why. Why they can't just use, like, some standard style. But the, t the great thing is, we don't care. Because it's as easy as selecting it from a drop-down list, right? So those are the things I want to show you about this. That's half of our time. We covered how to use Reference Manager and how to do some stuff in Word. Can I answer any questions before we move on to figures? You said you're going to, this is like a screenshot. It's I'm screen screenshotting this. I'll post it to YouTube. Uh, what's your, will you post a link to your YouTube? Yeah, I'll, I'll share that again. Any, any other questions with this? I promise this will make your lives a lot easier. So the only tricky thing is downloading that site while you write plugin, and even that's not hard. Again, format, site while you write plugin. It's like one file. It's. I think it's painless. I hope it is for Mac people, you Mac people that are out there. I hope it's also painless for you. You have shaky grooves. I love shaky. That's my I favorite band. Too. My absolute favorite band right now. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, okay, let's move on to figures. Having talked about Word and how to... And please, I, we didn't have time because I've got to run to a group meeting at five. But please, please do read this document, the MSC Lab Report Writing Guide. Your files in the this is under time. Files on Canvas. This really just talks in more detail about what should go in different sections. Should you use present tense or past tense? Should you use, you know, use the word we versus I? It talks about some of that stuff. What's the right length? You know, it covers a lot of stuff that I think that you'll like. So it's worth reading through this. And again, we wrote it. Faculty who you'll be writing lab reports for, we, we came up with this. Okay. So I'm going to close that. Now let's talk about figures. I am passionate about nice figures, like to the point where I'm quirky about it. Poor Emily and Christian who have worked for me before know that it's a pain in the butt because I like my figures to look really nice. And the reason why is because I did a postdoc with this guy named Ram Sashadri at UCSB who converted me to believing that if you're going to collect data, if you're going to spend the time to do the research, make sure that people can understand what you're talking about. Don't just report data mindless of whether people are listening or they can interpret it or they care. Make sure you answer those three things first, that they can understand it, that they're actually listening and that they care about it before you ever tell them what it is you did, right? And part of that is making nice figures. So let me skip some of his philosophy on that and jump. You know, and he's got opinions everything on like fonts. I don't know. I don't. I don't feel quite as strong on this. But there is some kind of 
science behind this on whether you use different fonts. And there's really two classes of fonts that you should care about, which is serif and sans serif. Right? Serif means it has a little B. I think serif means B, right? Some, uh, someone did that. A surf, like, surf. Like you know, we of spend of time on their feet? Well, I, I just know. they're kind of like the bottoms. Okay, right. okay. So these letters have those things, and because they do, it makes it easier for your eye to read long blocks of text that are in paragraphs, where it might be easy to like shift around if it didn't. So it's not a big difference, but it is a little bit nicer. So if you're going to write a block of text, as in like a research article, a serif font is nice. I don't care if you do this on your lab reports. Personally, pick whatever looks nice to you. I've seen it done both ways. At least that has like some rationale behind it. Now, if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation or something where it's a small block of text, a short blurb, you don't need the feet, and some of these actually look a little nicer, right? The sans serif, or serif free, right? Um, and he has a lot of opinions about those. I'm gonna skip some of this. Obviously, there is some font which we just shouldn't use because it looks childish, oh, right? Yeah, please don't do it. And I, we joke, but I had a student just last year, Tom, no, it was Chet, or Tom, one of the two, <laughs> they did a, they did a, um, a, 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 it was a, like a review meeting that we were getting together. Christian and I and our team was showing our, what our results were, and they were showing their results. And theirs was in like this old timey font with like the giant like, like the bullets shot through the letters. I don't know, it was bad. So don't do that. Um, let's now get to figures. Oh yeah, Logan was there, that's right. Uh, so now let's talk about figures. There, and figures, it's sort of one of those things like you know a good figure when you see it, and you know a bad figure when you see it, but there's aspects that we could actually identify, right? A good figure has things about it that we can actually talk about. For example, in this figure, an example of we think a good figure, you can feel free to differ, it's fine. But one of the things I like about this is that it's very easy to see that there's two different data sets we're talking about, and it's very easy to tell them apart in this figure. That's one thing I like about it. Second thing I like about this is that no matter where you're sitting, even in this hall where you might be a little bit away from this, you should be able to see more or less what these values correspond to. So that if you wanted to read a value off, it's a little bit easier to do so, right? They've done things like made tick marks which are intelligently spaced. They're actually the same spacing on the X and the Y axis, which makes it look more uniform and nice. The font here, everywhere throughout, the legend, labels, tick labels, are all the same size, and it's all large enough that you can see it from far away. Right? They've done a broken line here as opposed to a solid line and made the stroke rather large, it's easy to see. So if you print this, if you're you know, a cheap grad student who doesn't have a color printer and print this in grayscale, you'll still be able to see these two apart. On Tuesday we had a student who's colorblind, colorblind and red and uh, green are very hard to tell, but there's different types of colorblind, so that's one that's really hard to tell apart, right? So they've taken care to think about this stuff, right? Um, let's show some more. By the way, this is huge, right? If this was an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, that's a five inch figure. That's really big. So in your lab reports, imagine how big five inches is. It looks like that big sitting in the middle of your sheet. That's really big. Um, you probably don't want it that big. You're gonna shrink it down. In fact, many journal articles, they require you to shrink it to a two column format. I'm gonna ask Emily and Christian to have you guys turn in. In addition to using different references willy nilly, I'm gonna have them also occasionally ask you to turn in a two column format journal. Uh, uh, research report, right, for that week. And by the time you do that, that's going to make your figure shrink to three inches, right? If you had small text, maybe that text seemed big for you up here, but if it was any bit smaller, by the time you shrink that to three inches, it's getting difficult to read this, right? Same with the stroke. If the stroke wasn't very thick, these things can get kind of vanishingly small where they're hard to read. Um, Notice that they, they're using nice colors that look well together. They're using complementary colors, right? Orange and blue. If you want a trick for doing this, you can just go to the color wheel. If you want colors in general that look nice, there's tricks you can use. But the easiest is just to pick things that are opposite one another on the color wheel. Blue and orange look great together, right? Purple and yellows actually look really cool together. So picking things opposite each other on the color wheel is one way to do that. But pick colors that look nice. Where are we at? Oh, up here. Um, and avoid things that are hard to see, like look at this green and this yellow. That yellow you can't see, right? It's really, really hard to see. Or some stuff really stands out, and maybe that's okay. Maybe you want it to stand out because you're trying to draw attention to a data point or one of your dated lines as opposed to others. Just be cognizant that it destroys consistency. Maybe you want it to, but just be cognizant that it will. All right, now let's take that exact same data, the exact same data you just saw in the other figure, plotted. This is the default output of a plot called Maple. Anybody use Maple before? It's a math software. This is, if you say plot these two data sets, this is what it spits out. Look how much worse this is relative to the other one. Let's, what things do you see that you don't like about this? Anybody notice something? The numbers are tiny. You can't read any of these. 
Right? You can't smell it. It's no, thin stroke lines are too thin. Yeah. yeah, so the stroke and the colors, and also this is red and green. You can't see these if you're colorblind. That looks the same to you, right? There's no like stroke versus unstroke, or uh, no. Gashed. Gashed or yeah. Uh, what about this? You've got these huge, that's your separation is between major tick marks. Minor tick marks in there are major. Here, that's your major tick mark, right? So there's, it's just not consistent. This is not a square plot. I'm a big fan of square plots for the reason that when you shrink it, if you do put it in a two column format, it gives you more space. You can see your stuff easier. What do I mean? When you shrink this thing down, right? Compare these two data sets, right? By the time you shrink this down to three inches, because you had this in a square format, it's taller, you can just see this a little bit better. This stuff, these, these are completely legit, right? You've got these giant labels, and you can't read any of the numbers, right? So. It's, most of this is common sense stuff. I'm not telling you anything that should be surprising, I think. But I think what we often do as scientists, because this is common, this is a common, you'll see stuff like this all the time. And the problem is that scientists, we just don't think about our audience very often. We just write it up. We know that I'm writing for the TAs maybe, or I'm writing for the professor or you know, whoever, but I don't think about who's gonna interpret this later on. And uh, a little bit of care to make sure that it's easy to interpret goes a long way, right? So there's other things you can do. There's things like, um, so nice insets. You guys have all seen figures that has an inset in it. The normal way that people make an inset is they make two figures, then they take one, they shrink it down, and they just plop it on top. So the text that was on this usually gets shrunk super duper small. Here they've made a point to make it the same size as all your text throughout, right? It's all the same font size, so it's easy to read, even though you have taken up a small portion of the plot with this. Now insets work, but I think a better way to do insets is actually to do multi-panel plots. And Excel cannot do multi-panel plots that I know of. Maybe they're changing, maybe they can do it now. They can't do it as far as I know. But there's other software that can that I'll show you briefly how to do if we have time. Um, multi-panel plots are just a better way to show things. I'll show you some examples of why uh, in just a moment. Again, same exact data. In literature, you'll see this all the time. But they'll just take another figure, shrink it, and throw it on there. You can't read any of this. Why, why are you bothering to show me this if I can't interpret the data there? By the time you shrink that down to a two-column format, it's just gone. It's just not even there anymore. Another one is sometimes instruments we use are so old that it's not, or for whatever reason, it's not easy to get the XY data off. It just creates a figure, right? I'll see this all the time where students will take from the X-ray diffractometer, they'll just take the image and they'll just copy that and throw it in their lab report. And it looks cheesy. It doesn't actually focus on the information you care about. I just don't like it, right? So what would be great is if we had a way to take that data and turn it into something that you could plot in Excel or whatever else. So how would you do that? Let me ask you this. How you would you have do that? To, you have to Web plot oh. How would you do it? Well, the way that I did it in chemistry is um, we would get the file emailed to us from okay. something. Like a figure. Okay. Um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't a figure. It was numbers that you turned into a figure. Okay. And you put them, you uh, copy the X, your two columns that you want, you put it in Excel, and then uh, you make a graph out of that. Ah, uh, yeah. So, absolutely. That's what we'd like to do. We'd like to, in Excel, have a bunch of, you know, numbers. Uh, so, let's put equals random between 0 and 100, right? We're going to generate some numbers here. Um, once we have the numbers, it's easy to plot it in Excel. We just go to insert and you do this little scatter chart or whatever type of chart makes sense for you to plot, right? And you can plot it and, you know, Excel by default gives you stupid things like chart titles, which you should never use. It makes no sense to have a chart title. You know, yeah, if you use a chart title, justify it, because I don't think there's a reason. Should be in your figure. Just nice put your image. caption. Yeah, put your caption underneath, right? I think you can make these look kind of okay. You know, make it squarish. Make sure that this font, you know, I would make my font larger on both of these axes. You can't pick both at the same time, it's obnoxious. Or maybe you can. Anyways, right, you can make an Excel plot look kind of nice. Just take some care because the default setting is not always the best way to plot it. But the key thing is, like, how did you get this data in the first place from a JPEG, right? Right here, this, I could screen capture this. How do I do that? So. Uh, Conrad knows all about this because he spent a summer doing this. If How do you do it? If you ever need, uh, just go to webplot to digitizer.com. I, I, I use digitizer.com. I use a slightly different position right now. Oh, yeah, there's. You go to, web, you go to webplot digitizer. Webplot digitizer. So if you just Google webplot digitizer, I think it's the best tool out there. 
Here's why I like it. You don't have to download anything. It just runs in your browser and it's automatic. It will collect your data automatically. Here's how. So you go, wonderful, launch the app. Well, first off, you have to grab your data. So previous to you guys being here, I copy and I just did a screen capture of this screen. I just did like a capture my screen, right? So I've got that saved as a, as a JPEG or something. So right here, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load an image. Cause this is just like the practice. If you wanna learn about their software, they just come with something default here. We wanna do our own data. So I'm gonna load an image. I'm gonna choose our file which is this plot digitizer file, right? So I have to tell it that it's actually a 2D plot with XY points. It's not like a bar plot or a radial plot or something. Apparently it can read those. I've never done anything but a 2D plot. So now the next step is we need to align the axes. From this, you need to give it certain data points so you can read the axes, right? So you have to give it one, two, three, four points on the axes and tell it what those correspond to. And after you do that, then you can read any points you want, right? Now the problem is the barbarians that made this figure didn't even <laughs> give us tick marks. And they won't. there's a lot of problems with this figure, right? The biggest one is that they didn't give you tick marks. And this is a spectroscopy file. The, the, the key thing you want from a spectroscopy file is to figure out the wave number, the position at which one of these events occurs, right? Oftentimes the intensity is not even that important. It's just you need to know where it's at. And you can't even read that because this is 1500 going, first off, it's getting bigger that way, which is weird, but whatever. Right? And then they have no tick marks, right? So we're going to do our best, right? The fact that they didn't include it really limits the accuracy that we're going to have in interpreting this data. We'll do our best. We're going to put one of these right on the 3500, right in the middle. Now, if you look in the top right corner, it zooms in. That makes it a little bit easier, right? You so can I'm, actually move with your arrow keys as well. Oh, genius. Okay. I didn't know that. You should, or you can if you. I don't know how to do that. Maybe, well, I don't know. Anyways, well, try and get that. You, once you put, put the, no, can I move it once it's selected? Okay, so. Oh, okay. Anyways, so do your best to figure out where these are. Hopefully they have tick marks. If it's tick marks, you can be very accurate. Um, in this case, the y-axis doesn't really matter. They're arbitrary units, but they didn't tell us that because they're barbarians and they didn't include the fact that the y-axis doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. Anyways, we've got this. So now that we're, we're done with those four points, we hit OK. And it asks, what are those points? So we say, OK, the first x point is at 3,500. The second x point is at 500. The first y point is at zero, the second one is at one, right? And neither of them are on a log scale. They're both linear scales, just one's backwards on the x, but it, it knows that. We don't have to worry about it. We hit OK, and now at any given point, if I scroll over this, like let's say this point up here, that should be about 1701, and you see it's doing that. I know the scientific notation, but 1701. Right? Pretty great. Pretty great. But it gets even better. So now what you can do is, right now it's set to manual mode, and I'm set to add a point. And if I click anywhere on here, it'll start grabbing those points, right? If I click right on that, it'll start grabbing points, right? This is grabbing those points. That's a, that works, and sometimes you have to do that. I've had to do that before. But it'd be even better if we could automate this process and have it just grab our points. So let's go do that. Let's click automatic. We're going to clear our points, first off. We're gonna clear those points. Say, so, yep, we don't care if we erase them. Let's click automatic mode. In automatic mode, it will collect everything of a certain color, right? So let's say, you know, this is black line. So let's just tell it to click, click here and then take everything that's black and collect that data. And then you just hit run and it's gonna freak out because I'll show you. It's looking at the whole screen, right? It sees everything that's black on my screen and it says data, right? And it's grabbing it. Um, so we obviously, we don't want all that data, but there's an easier way to limit it, right? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna clear the data points. Right? We're going to now go to the pen. Wait. Pen, right? Okay. Pen. And I'm just going to, with this pen, I'm going to draw on this thing. Right? And you can actually scribble, because as long as you only get the black stuff that you want to collect, it's fine. If I scribble over here, it won't matter. I just need to collect all this black stuff. So I would take a minute and I would do that. I'm not going to do it all for you. But I'm going to hit run. And now it only collects data points where you had that line on there, which is pretty sweet, right? You still might get a few random ones, especially if you have data points that are overlapping. Let's say you had like one line here and one line here. Where they overlap, it might collect some on the other line. You know what I'm saying? It might get a little bit wrong there. But you can always edit that in Excel afterwards. You're going to have a list of all your data points. You can throw those individual ones out. Generally speaking, this is a pretty easy way to collect it. Now, this default setting is that every 10 pixels, it takes a data point. But there's some really fine details here. We could probably get even more accurate if we change it and tell it to collect more often. So here under this delta x and delta y, let's clear our points again. And let's do uh, set this to 1 and 1. So every single pixel, it's going to collect another data point. 
right? And so it's doing something funny, but there's a ton of data there. You can see all those points, right, in the zoomed in window. There's a ton of data points and clicks there. So whenever you're ready, you're ready to export your data, then you just go to view data. It's all right here, just tons of it. You can copy and paste it from here, or you can download the CSV. Yeah, I would download the CSV usually, because um, usually if you download the CSV, you just open in Word, and then just change. If you don't want to do the CSV anymore, I mean, and export it, you can just change the, um, change the format while when you're saving it. Um, the other important thing to know about digitizers up top with the, is like the tabs. Um, if you screw up your accents, you can always just recalibrate without redownloading the plot. But also, there's a data tab, and you can make multiple data sets. So if you have one graph that has like, if you go to uh -huh. manage data sets, if you have one graph that has like five different lines on it, you manage data sets. And you can and you them can, all and together. you can add data sets, you can name each of those data sets. Uh, and then you cool. can, um, uh, when you are like psyching data right here, you um, choose this and you just like you go to the next data set, right? So like you just made a data set. That's really cool. Um, and then when you're exporting the data set, so like if you already now have three data sets, when you click view data, you just also have a drop down above your data. Um, and that way you don't have to reload the same image multiple times where you can like. Or redo the axis. Yeah, time. or redo the axis. So you can just really easily I didn't know off that. one graph make four or five different um, plots. Like your data sets. I didn't know yeah. that. That's, that's terrific. Um, anyways, once you have it, now you uh, you download this file. It's going to open it up in Excel. It already separates it for you. And then you could go ahead and create, you know, whatever nice plot you want about this, right? I mean, whatever. You have to invert the axes, obviously, if you want it to make it look like the original, but it grabs that data for you. Any questions on how to do this? So you can pull up any image mm -hmm. from any website and then just save it. And as create a file. your own data. And, then and obviously, if you're using somebody else's data, you should cite it, and you should right. say data adapted, figure t adapted from such and such a reference. Mm -hmm. Totally fine. Then you're totally in the clear to do that. Nothing also, unethical about it. If you're grabbing data, data from a table, um, there's a software called Tabula. That, that does the same thing. That they, pretty much, rather than going through the table and having to like try to copy paste everything, it recognizes tables and will automatically export it to a CSV for you. And it's usually pretty good at um, giving you a really nice so you can text what the data is. Really it's called Tabula? Yeah, it takes tables from PDFs, so you just download yeah. the PDF. So you just, as long as you're able to download the PDF, you can quickly go through it. Um, you get blocked. That, but it is a software so you have to download on your computer. It's not, um, it's not the same where it's just on the browser. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let me say a few more words. I've got a split in five minutes. So let's just say a few more words about this. Um, you guys will generate a lot of microscopy images this semester. You'll take optical micrograph images as well as scanning electron micrograph images. If you, anybody used a SEM before? Yeah, today. Just today, you did? Oh, you did already today? Oh, well done. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, scanning electron microscopes are fantastic. And honestly, it's one of the more important skills that you'll get from this uh, degree. People hiring MSE grads, they want you to do characterization a lot of times. They want to hand you a part that broke and they want to say, figure out why it broke. And oftentimes that means looking at it under a microscope, identifying flaws, identifying what went wrong. So you're gonna generate images like this. This is a fine image, right? This is okay. It can be better though. One of the reasons I think it can be better is because if you look at these, uh, most SEMs will automatically generate a list of data down here, which was associated with how you collected the image, right? Things like the accelerating voltage, the spot size, the working distance. It's not that those things aren't important. It's just that they don't belong in this figure. You're not reporting on how you put that when you show the figure. You'd have, if it was important, you would have described it in your experimental methods section, if it was important. Oftentimes it's not. Like you don't need to report working distance and spot size in your methods unless that's a key part of the research, right? So it'd be good to get rid of this because it's, it's small and hard to see, and so it's a distraction, right? It's all about maximizing your signal to noise ratio. You want people to draw attention to the signal, which you care about them learning, and minimize things that are going to distract them, right? The noise. So what you can do is you can take this and you can make it a square image just by cropping that whole part out. And then the one piece of information that you did want, replotting it yourself such that it's easy to see. The piece of information you wanted is the scale bar, right? Right? Is this, are we looking at the surface of the moon or is this microscopic? You don't know without the scale bar, right? Now that you've got the scale bar, you know that you're looking at some microscopic features on this. And you know how big they are, right? You know that the particles are roughly about a micron in size. The pores are about a micron in size, right? So this is now easy to see. You made this large. I have my students do this all the time now. Take your SM image, crop it square, put your own, uh, what do you call it, a scale bar on there so it's easy to read. Okay, there's a bunch of now, I think, just good examples here. We'll just talk about a few of them briefly. 
So here's an example of a really nice multi-panel plot. We, we use multi-panel plots. Um, I use them most of the time when you have a common x-axis. It really makes it easier to interpret sometimes data if you have a common x-axis, right? In this case, they did three different experimental techniques, right? They did at the top, this is on a magnetic measurement. Here they did a, a specific heat measurement, so it's a thermal measurement. And here they did diffraction, which measures the structure of something. Well, here Jake. we have Jake. Yeah. <laughs> we have five. We're monster in here, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, always, <laughs> always. <laughs> um, uh, so the point, what they were, the reason that they showed this figure is they were trying to argue in their paper is that at a certain temperature, there's an event occurring that is coupled magnetic, thermal, and structure. All those things, something happens that relates to all three of those. So by plotting them all in the same x-axis and making it easy to see, right, they've got the x-axis here, the same one here. You guys can cut across me. Just waiting for you. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> right, they were able to show it really nicely. Now, heat maps are a great way to show a ton of information. You've got 3D data. Heat maps are nice. But it's hard to tell with your human eye exactly what's going on here. So they were nice, and they added as add-ons on the wings of this heat map what the actual data looked like for one slice of this, right? They took that 3D data and made one slice of 2D, and they plotted it, and they showed, you know, this is what the actual data is here versus up here, so you can clearly see that there's an obvious difference here. I think this is a really nice way to represent data. Another thing I like about this is that when you report data, you should show your data points as points, right? Even if they're lying on top of each other, because this helps you know, all right, how small of a step size did they take with respect to temperature or whatever else when you collected it. If you just show a line here, I'm left to wonder, is this from like five or six data points that then they connect the dots? But by showing the actual data, you know, it tells you something about the carefulness of the experiment. So whenever you collect data, I'm a big fan of showing the actual data points, even if they lie on top of each other, right? I think that's the right way to do it. Um, okay, let's do a couple more. We're almost done. Again, even if you shrink that down, you can still read it nicely in a two-column format. Um, other things you can do. So he suggests that you avoid dark backgrounds. And even if you have like amazing data, a dark background can make it look kind of stupid. Like here's the discovery of superconductivity. By all means, a pretty awesome thing. And it looks stupid on a dark background. So I would suggest that we uh, also not do that. Here's an example of a micrograph image, which I think was really well done. What they're trying to show you here, I was there when they did this work. They wanted to show that as you had different length scales of your material, you had different things happening, right? So if you zoom way out, you've got a big scale bar indicating that it's zoomed out. Here they show the microstructure. And you can see that there's like this heterogeneous, interesting structure. So then they zoom in down to 50 microns, and they label, oh, these are actually two different phases, the half hoiser and the full hoiser. That would be in the caption. You have to tell them shortcuts like that. You have to tell your readers what that is. And then C, they actually do a selected area diffraction pattern, which is proving that they know what one of these phases are, right? So again, it's only taking up one figure spot. You could have made three separate figures, but this just looks nicer. It's, it's telling you the key information that as a function of hierarchy in terms of length scales, you see something happening here. Okay, okay almost done. One more key thing I want to show you, which is how you make figures like this. I won't be able to show you how to do it today, but I'll at least say that it's possible and it's not hard to do. If you're talking about crystal structures, we're material scientists. A key part of what we do is we relate a property to a processing to a structure, right? The property you got is due to the structure that you started with, right? Or if you change the structure, you're going to get a different property, right? So it's critical, oftentimes for us, to describe changes in the structure. And that can even be crystal structure, right? Let's say you doped it or you mixed a different mixture of elements and you go from having SR2Ti1 to having SR4Ti3, right? Now you can try and explain what's happening in the crystal structure with words. You can say, all right, there's these. It's layered structure, and there's different blocks. This is called a perovskite block, and there's different numbers of those, and you're going to lose your audience if you try and do that. I, I usually have my students try and do this, like interpret one where they don't use figures and they explain it. It's just so hard. Picture, like worth a million, like a thousand words, right? This easily tells you what's going on here. You've got three different structures, and in the text, you can talk about the number of these repeating units, but here you can easily show going from one to two to three as you change the composition of this, right? So you can make figures like this using a software called Vesta, V-E-S-T-A. It's free. It's actually very easy to use, I think. At some point in the semester, I'll make it uh, required on assignment to use it, so you'll get a chance to, to try it out anyways. But just realize it's not hard to do, and you can make really nice looking, high quality figures with it. Okay, I think we're almost done. Let me see if there's anything else I definitely want to cover before we wrap it up. We already talked about references. Um, some more resources you want to read more. Um, there's a guy named Jean-Luc Dumont, and I'll share a link to him. Uh, he's really the master on 
communicating science. It is well, well, well worth your time to take an hour over your lunch break while you're eating your sandwich and just watch a YouTube video of what he has to say about communicating science because it forever changed how I, I do it. I think it's, it'll be in your best interest. Okay, any questions I can answer? Uh, did you screen? Uh, I did. This whole thing no, screen capped. The, the URL you gave over the summer about. I did. I've got all those. Okay, so you should probably post that because yep. you did an entire hour and a half talk on this slideshow and went into detail about the software it uses to make the graphs look really good. Yep. So, I can post that. Yeah, I'll post that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank